Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. So today I'm going to do something a little different. No trailer reaction today. Instead, what I want to do is basically, now that 2021 is coming to a close, we can't help but ignore that Marvel Studios have given us a lot of treats this year. I mean, considering the fact that last year in 2020 was a dud due to the fact that the coronavirus pandemic started and basically ruined everybody's plans. But um, Hollywood and a lot of other studios, including um, the MCU, made it up for us here in 2021. So, so much content to discuss. Um, I'm basically, what I want to do is basically rank which were my top favorites of this year. Uh, I'm going to go from worst to best. Basically, what I like from least favorite to most favorite of this year. Uh, phase 4, right? Marvel Studios started Phase 4 this year in 2021 instead of last year, 2020. So, let's go ahead and get started. So, at the bottom of my list, I am going to put um, at number... Let me see. Wait, let me think. So, there was four movies, right? And there was five Disney Plus shows, if I'm not mistaken. Because you have four movies, which was Black Widow, Shang-Chi, Eternals, and Spider-Man. Then you had five Disney Plus shows. WandaVision, Falcon Winter Soldier, Loki, What If, and Hawkeye. Yes, I think I got all of them. I hope I'm not missing any. But let me know down in the comments below if I am. So we had nine projects that were released this year. So starting off with my least favorite at number nine is Black Widow. <laughs> if you guys have seen my mini spoiler review on my channel regarding Black Widow, I thought the movie, it had its problems. It did have its flaws. Is it good in some moments? Yes. Is it nice to see Natasha, uh, played by Scarlett Johansson, finally get her movie? Yeah, but I just wish it could have been done better, um, which is kind of unfortunate. I mean, you know, if one knows the whole Black Widow comics lore and the history of the character, I felt like they could have done more with her story in this movie. Um, I said in my review, instead of having this movie take place in between Civil War and Infinity War, they should have gone way, way back to the events before Iron Man 2, so we could see, um, you know, the early, more of the early days of Natasha's relationship with her sister Yelena, you know, maybe they could have ex explored a little bit more of that, like their early days. Or also how Natasha met up with Hawkeye when Clinton Barton was sent by S.H.I.E.L.D. to um, hunt her down and what made Clinton Barton change his mind to accept um, Natasha into the field and even Nick Fury, how Natasha met Nick Fury and why Nick Fury considered her to be the best in the field, why Nick Fury saw her as, as his like a right wing woman, right? So I would have liked to see more of that instead of using the villain Taskmaster who I felt, to be honest, I know in the comics, Taskmaster, basically any movements or abilities that he, comics, it's a he, sees, um, he is able to copy those moves or, you know, mimic those moves for his own advantage. Um, but here, they gender swapped the character, which I had no problem with, but I just felt like the character was so underused. And it just felt like the, there was a the whole idea of mind control being used. And I felt like they could have totally substituted the Winter Soldier character instead. And like I said, if this movie had taken place before the events of Iron Man 2, we could have gotten a little bit more history as to what it, um, it meant when Black Widow, you know, confronted the Winter Soldier. She does mention that briefly in Captain America the Winter Soldier when she's talking to Steve Rogers in the hospital that uh, the Winter Soldier supposedly shot her in the stomach. And we don't, I would have loved to have seen that confrontation, you know, I think, uh, I just feel like it was such a missed opportunity that Nick Fury was not in the movie, that Hawkeye was not in the movie, and that the Winter Soldier was not in the movie. Those three characters should have been in the movie. Um, I would have liked to see more of like the early years, uh, not so much the kid years, but like the early adulthood years of Natasha with her sister Elena. 
use Red Guardian more properly, basically, instead of just having him come off as comedic relief. I thought David Harper, um, you know, yeah, he was funny, I'm not gonna lie. It was funny some of the things he did and said. But instead of just using him for comic relief, they could have just, you know, I don't know, I just felt like they could have used him more properly. And also Rachel Weiss's character, I felt her character was so unnecessary in the movie, and I didn't care for her, her character. So yeah, that's why I have this movie basically at the bottom of my list. Moving on to number eight is Eternals. Um, I do remember that before, way before this movie came out, um, a lot of people had high hopes for this movie due to the fact that Chloe Zhao, the director, won an Academy Award for her directing on No Man's Land, um, which for a lot of people say it's a really good movie. I mean, that's why it won the award. So a lot of people had, um, like, a, I guess you could say a positive outlook for the movie Eternals. Even uh, I heard that Kevin Feige was really promoting the movie to be like up for the Oscars, basically. However, then the reviews came in, and it wasn't, uh, it didn't have, like, fresh scores, basically, just so to say. There was a lot of rotten reviews, negative reviews surrounding this movie. Um, and of course, even when I saw the trailer for the first time, I honestly didn't know how to feel about the movie. I was like, hmm, I don't know. The trailer's making me wonder, you know, but of course I'm gonna go see it so I can judge for myself, and I did. And I could see why some liked it some didn't and truth be told even though this movie got negative mostly negative reviews i didn't think it was that bad truth be told i think it was a little bit better than black widow which is why i have it at number eight but i think what kind of puts this movie at a disadvantage is the fact that there's too much story you know you have, you're introducing 10 new characters who supposedly have been here for 7,000 years on earth so that's a lot of character development to cover and a lot of history and story to cover in just a two and a half hour movie. It's a lot of story and when the characters talk about what they did in the past and all the stuff they have done, you kind of wish you would have seen it basically instead of them just telling you like exposition and whatnot. Um, so you know you, you kind of miss out on that and um, Part of me wonders if this should have been a Disney Plus show so that way you could flesh out the characters a bit more and so that all the characters can get an equal amount of screen time. Yes, the main focus of this movie, it was mentioned before even by the director herself, that the main focus or the main character of the movie was going to be Cersei, played by Gemma Chan. Icarus, played by Richard Madden, was probably like the second main character. Um, so, you know, of course, obviously those two probably have the most screen time. But considering that this movie is called Eternals and it's like a group team up movie, you kind of wish you would have gotten a bit more of everybody, like equally. Like I felt, for example, Makari, she came, like you saw her in flashbacks, but she came in like in present day way later in the movie. Uh, Kingo, he wasn't even in the final battle. And also Gilgamesh, you know, he died like midway in the movie. So, it, you know or even Ajax, she'd also kind of died, and there's only flashbacks of her, so, you know, you kind of don't get much of the characters as you would have hoped, so to say. Other than that, I thought the visuals were very beautiful in the movie. I mean, Chloe Zhao knows how to do her visuals. It's really beautiful with the sun setting on the ocean when they were fighting uh, at the very end. And I will say this, this movie knows how to handle the ships, <laughs> that's all I'm going to say. Um, yeah, you have your Icarus and Cersei as the main couple of the movie, but they're not the ones who stole the show. I know there's a lot of supporters for Gilgamesh and uh, Athena. Uh, th those two were cool together, but I didn't see them romantically. I saw them more as like partners in crime kind of thing, like, you know, just like best friends and that was it. But the couple that sold the show for me was uh, Druig and Makari. I thought those two had amazing chemistry. Drew Kari forever, guys. Um, yeah, they those two had sparks. More sparks than Icarus and Cersei, for sure. And even Chloe Zhao was a supporter of the couple. So, yeah, I mean, that was a surprise couple for a lot of fans, actually. Yeah, so those two, for me, those two are the highlight of the movie, is the Drew Kari ship. And then even when Druid 
tells Makari, like, you know, he calls her my beautiful, beautiful Makari, it makes one melt. You know, you can't help but be like, oh, like, there's sparks flying everywhere. So, yeah, I'm Drew Kari forever, guys. Yeah, so those are my thoughts on Eternals. Now, moving on to number seven. Number seven, um, this was a little tough, I guess you could say, because cause this now entering into, like, Disney Plus show territory, and each one was unique in their own way. Of course, you're going to have a preference, though, over one over the other. At number seven, I'm going to put the animated series, What If? The only reason why is because, um... It was a fun show. I thought the the way they handled the finale when you get the characters from different universes coming together, the Guardians of the Multiverse, uh, so that they could work together to stop evil Ultron Vision, who was freaky uh, and scary. You know, I thought that was cool. But, you know, since it was in cartoon form, I guess you could say... I don't know, I, I felt... Like, since it was in cartoon form, the stakes didn't feel as high for me, if that makes any sense. Um, how can I say it? Like, I guess if it was in, like, action, then maybe it'd be a little bit more like, oh, like, this feels like more, I, I don't know how to explain it, more, like, like, the stakes would probably feel more real because it is in live action form versus in cartoon. Basically, the medium of how the show was, you know, delivered kind of affects, I guess you could say, your perception, but I am hearing that the cartoon version of What If is canon in the MCU, I mean, it is being produced by MCU, right, and released on Disney+, Plus. so, and that supposedly some of the characters from What If will be uh, appearing in Doctor Strange into the Multiverse of Madness, so you could say it is canon, um, but, you know, it was just more like, it was just like a fun, it was a fun little show, um, that didn't feel as necessary to watch, if that makes any sense. Um, but I guess my big takeaway from the show was Ultron Vision. Out of all the MCU villains, I don't know why, but I felt frightened by him the most. And this was a cartoon. Now I'm kind of like, uh, basically making going in loops here about the show. What if like I didn't feel the stakes were as high, maybe with the heroes. But with the villain, yes. I don't know. I don't know what I'm saying, but I'm just having this show at number seven. I did, like, basically, I guess you could say I enjoyed that character's story more versus, like, the other characters. I could probably care less about the other characters. If, I guess that's make, what makes any sense as to what I'm trying to say. Like, for example, Party Thor, his story was funny, but I didn't care too much about it. Um, Captain Carter was cool, but wasn't that big of a deal for me. I really enjoyed uh, Star Lord T'Challa. I thought his story was really interesting. Um, the zombie ones was were were cool, but um, you know, again, you know, it was like, oh, okay, like so. So um, the Doctor Strange one was kind of heartbreaking, right? He basically destroys his whole whole universe trying to save uh, his the love of his life, but it still doesn't work out. Um, but yeah, I think. For me, out of all the characters, the, the craziest one was Ultron Vision. It was just super, super scary. <laughs> I was literally frightened by him. The fact that he was basically destroying planet after planet to the point where then he figured out that there was a multiverse and he was willing to go and destroy that too. I was like, oh snap, this got real. This got real. So I do have that at number seven on my list. Now moving on to number six, I, I want to put Hawkeye. As number six on my list um, I felt the show I did like the aesthetic of it like you know the winter season in New York I thought that was really nice um, I did like the dynamic and the relationship between uh, Clint Barton and Kate Bishop I thought that was really fun uh, so yeah I thought they, those were cool I just felt like the show started off a little bit slow um, and it kind of took a while for it to pick it up but then as um, it got closer to the finale, then it was like, okay, like, you know, you, it, it made up for it. It had the big action fight scenes at the very end. It was cool to see the return of Elena. Uh, since it was hinted at the end of Black Widow, she thinks that Hawkeye was responsible for Natasha's death. So it was cool to see her come back. And I love um, Elena's dynamic with Kate Bishop. You could tell 
that those two are going to be besties later down the road in the MCU, so that was kind of fun. Um, it was also cool to see the return of Vincent D'Onofrio as Kingpin from the Netflix Daredevil series. Um, it's it, really awesome to see Kevin Feige, who's the head of Marvel Studios, kind of wrecked in, or retcon, sorry, all of the um, previous Marvel projects that were like not in the MCU, and then he's like bringing them into the MCU, so that way you can explore more characters, interact with other characters that are within the Avengers, and we we see Kingpin, played by Vincent D'Onofrio, come back, so that was really awesome to see. I heard some fans complain that they were upset that, you know, he's died, basically, at the end of Hawkeye, since the fact that uh, Maya Lopez, aka Echo, shot him, but that's a parallel in the comics. That does happen in the comics, and of course, Kingpin, being the big muscle man that he is, survives. He gets injured, yes, but he survives, so this is not the end of Kingpin. He's definitely going to come back. And I'm curious to see what Kevin Feige and Marvel do next with his character. This isn't the end of Kingpin. He definitely is coming back. I also am curious to see what's going to happen with Hawkeye and Kate Bishop moving forward. Um, you know, will Jeremy Renner continue with the character? I don't know. But, you know, you could t totally tell that Kate Bishop is basically going to be the new Hawkeye for the new generation, right? So, um, it was it was interesting. So it did start off a little slow, but I think it hit the landing pretty well. I like the big action scene at the very end. I thought it was a lot of fun. So I do have Hawkeye as my sixth uh, favorite so far. Now going into number five. At number five, well, for me, will probably be the Loki series. Uh, the reason why I have this at number five is because I'm kind of same thing with Hawkeye. It does start off slow a little bit. But the finale is where it really kicks in. And the finale is a bit larger than life, a bigger impact than the Hawkeye finale, due to the fact that it introduces Kang the Conqueror, played by Jonathan Majors. Um, it is confirmed that he will also appear in Ant-Man 3 Quantum Mania. Uh, so, and considering the fact that Marvel is now exploring the multiverse, alternate realities, different timelines, multiple universes, you know that Kang the Conqueror is out to wreak havoc. So that is it's going to be interesting and I bet a whole lot of fun. When at the very end of Loki, when you see Loki surprised that um, Mobius, who is played by Owen Wilson, and other um, soldiers from the TVA, the Timekeepers, and, um, oh my gosh, all of them, that they can't remember who he is, and Loki looks up and he sees the statue of where the Timekeepers used to be is now the statue of King the Conqueror, you know that it just got real. Everything is changing, the multiverse is happening, um, so yeah, this is gonna be a whole lot of fun, and I also heard that Loki and Mobius supposedly might appear in Doctor Strange 2 into the Multiverse of Madness. I don't know, but I think it seems appropriate since they are exploring different timelines now in the MCU. So we'll see what happens. But so again, like I said, Loki may have started off a little bit slow, but then it picks it up a bit and it leaves a big impact in the finale due to the fact that Kang the Conqueror is now introduced. They say that Kang the Conqueror well, by some Marvel fans that he's worse than Thanos due to the fact that when it comes to time and reality and multiverses, you know, the, it, things can go get crazy. And that's, I feel like, what we're going to see there down the line. Um, so yeah, I have Loki at number five. Moving on to number four for me will probably be Falcon and the Winter Soldier, or actually better called Captain America and the Winter Soldier. Um, I do enjoy the political intrigue that was heavily used in this show. Well, when you consider about Captain America, the whole mythos of Captain America, it, it's always political intrigue involved since, I mean, he is like the symbol of America, right? So you're going to get into a lot of politics. But it, it, it's stuff that makes 
you know, you think as to how society works. For example, I love the fact that in the show, they bring up the fact of would America be ready, not just America, but the world, would the world be ready to accept a black Captain America? And, you know, it makes you wonder, would they? And I like the fact that they introduced Isaiah Bradley, who was the second Captain America after Steve Rogers, when Steve Rogers went under the ice during the Korean War, which was like around the, in the 1950s. And it's so sad because you see Steve Rogers, who's blonde hair and blue eyes, you know, get treated with uh, like celebration and parades and everything. But poor Isaiah Bradley, because of the color of his skin, He's just tested and tested time after time to the point where when they don't need him anymore, he's thrown in jail. So it's so sad to see that because that, you know, that did happen in real life to, um, you know, minorities in the U.S. It's really sad to say, but that is something that really happened. So when Sam Wilson learns about this, it kind of hits you. It hits you really hard, especially for him as a, a black person, right? And... He even, when he's with Bucky, you know, walking down the street from Isaiah Bradley's house and the cops stop them, the cops think that it's Sam Wilson who's causing havoc or bothering Bucky. But when they realize that Sam Wilson is actually the Falcon, then they're like, oh, like, we're sorry, um, Mr. Wilson. We didn't know you were, like, you know, one of the Avengers. And it, it, it goes into the whole idea of, like, you know, the whole Black Lives Matter, the whole Black Lives Matter movement and, you know, how do we view people in our society kind of thing. You also see that in terms of a U.S. agent who was temporarily the new Captain America, right? Um, I can't remember his name at the moment. I don't know why. I, I know he was played by Wyatt Russell, but he's basically now U.S. agent in the, in, in the MCU. And, you know, he truly thought he deserved to be the new Captain America because he thought he was better than everybody else in the field. So he thought he earned uh, the title. However, the, the what makes Steve Rogers such a unique Captain America and as to how Sam Wilson, why you see Sam Wilson was picked by Steve Rogers was due to the fact that they have a moral compass. They have heart. They understand that the, the, the person who's going to carry the shield it's not all about strength or being the perfect soldier, as in the words of uh, the scientist that uh, made the super soldier serum. It's all about being a good man. And I love the fact that the show explores that. Also in terms of Bucky, right? Him, you know, for so many years, he's been trying to redeem himself from his past as the Winter Soldier. Um, and you see that when he befriends uh, a neighbor in his neighborhood and he finds out that he's the father of one of his victims you know Bucky has to really decide if he's gonna tell him or not it it it, it, it was you know it was emotional it was pretty emotional and so yeah I, th I thought they did a really good job with the characters with the character arcs of Sam Wilson um Bucky and also of U.S. agent I thought they were written really well uh, I thought Zemo was cool. I thought he didn't really need to be in the show, but it was cool to see him back kind of thing. Same with Sharon Carter. It was nice to see her again, but I didn't feel like, mm, was it necessary? I don't know. It's up for you guys to decide. I just felt kind of bad for her because she helped Captain America and the gang, you know, to get uh, their stuff during the Civil War, and then she ends up being on the run and wanted by the U.S. government. So it kind of sucks for her. However, I am curious to know what her future is moving forward in the MCU due to the fact that it was revealed that she's the power broker. I've heard rumors that she might be working with, like, you know, sinister organizations in the MCU, such as, like, the Ten Rings, maybe. So who knows? She might be um, getting them some new technology and whatnot. I don't know. But other than that, I, I am excited to see what Marvel plans to do now that they have announced that they're going to do Captain America 4 starring Anthony Mackie as the new Captain America. So, yeah, this this is this is happening. This is happening. So, I can't wait to see what they'll do with the character moving forward, but I hope they do it justice. Now, moving on to number 3 on my list. Number 3 is a 
another Disney Plus show that basically got Marvel started this year in 2021. It was released in January early of this year, and that is WandaVision. Um, WandaVision, I think, the reason why I have it at number three is due to the fact that every time the episode ended, it left you on a click on a cliffhanger. Yes, all the other Marvel shows did as well, but there was something about WandaVision that really ended on a cliffhanger. Because, you know, we know that Scarlet Witch is going to be in uh, Doctor Strange Multiverse of Madness, so you kind of get a hint of that in this show. You kind of get a hint more of her powers, basically, what she's capable of doing. They explore more of that. Um, the fact that you know, you, you see her pain, you see her grief over Vision, you know, the love of her life, basically. And she controls this whole town just to make herself feel better. So, you know, you see, it, it, it's the tragedy of the character, basically. Um, that it, it's, it's something, it, it's so, it's handled so well. The writing is handled very well. And I liked how, at the very beginning, of the show it starts out very quirky you know very cheesy 1950s sitcom right and it explores all the different sitcoms throughout the decades but then the more you get towards modern era the more everything starts to unravel and you see more of Wanda's psychosis her her, her mental breakdown basically she's grieving over the loss of vision and the way they slowly unravel everything like it, it's it's interesting how it was handled. It was very interesting how it was handled. I like the fact that the show kept audiences guessing. That's why the cliffhangers were so impactful. Because each week, people had so many theories as to what was going to happen. Oh, who's controlling Westview? Is it Wanda? Is it um, Agatha Harkness? Is it Mephisto? You know, who is the real culprit behind controlling Westview? So I think that's what makes the show so interesting, is that each episode kept people theorizing, guessing more and more. It kept you on the edge of your seat, basically. Um, of course, at the, when the finale was revealed, you know, um, I know some fans were a little disappointed because there was some a lot of, like, red hearings. Like, for example, when <laughs> the guy who came in as uh, Pietro Maxima, Wanda's brother, from like the X-Men universe, um, the actor who plays Piet Quicksilver from the X-Men universe, he technically wasn't that Qu Quicksilver, he was just some random guy that Agatha Harkness used called um, Ralph Boner or something like that. It was, I could understand by some fans, including myself, I was like a little disappointed, like, oh man, would have missed the opportunity. It would have been cool if that was that character from the X Men universe, but whatever. But other than that, I do think the way um, it was handled in terms of leaving every episode at a cliffhanger, seeing the the craziness unravel into how you know Wanda's grief and her her trauma was being handled. I thought it was I thought the writing was done very well through sitcoms throughout the decades. I thought it was handled very well. Now, number two on my list, maybe not everyone will agree with it, but the reason why I have it on number two, I will explain why. And that is Spider-Man No Way Home. This movie, out of all the Spider-Man movies that I have seen, is the best, the best Spider-Man movie to date. It knocked it out of the park. I do remember, I remember hearing the rumors that, oh, Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield are coming back. I'm like, oh my gosh, they're coming back? Really? Like, like the multiverse is happening. Oh my goodness. But then, of course, the actors would deny it. Like, no, it's not true. It's not true. And I thought to myself, like, okay, they're denying it. Maybe it's not true. So I didn't want to get my hopes up, basically, in case that wasn't, you know, true. But it ended up being true. All three Spider-Men were standing next to each other on the big screen. I was like, oh my goodness. And all of the previous Spider-Man villains from both the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man movies and the Andrew Garfield Spider-Man movies came back. It was so surreal to see that. Like, like this movie basically really explores the multiverse. Of course, Doctor Strange is going to continue with that. But this one for me more so than WandaVision, really explored the multiverse. Loki did a bit too, 
because of Kang the Conqueror. But this one really showcased the multiverse, really did. I mean, the fact that you brought those other actors back, playing the same role, you know, basically confirms that those movies are not in a sense remakes. They're actually considered canon in the MCU. They're just from a different timeline in a different universe. So I thought that was so clever for Marvel Studios to do, and it worked so well. It was a lot of fun. It was just a lot of fun to see all the Spider-Men that I grew, that I grew up watching. I remember seeing the Tommy McGuire Spider-Mans when I was only in elementary school. And now look, now I'm like in my late twenties, and Tom Holland is now the, the current Spider-Man. So it's amazing to see how time has flown by. It it really has. It's it's crazy that that has happened. The only reason why I have it on number two and not number one, I know some people in the comments are gonna be like, why is this not number one? The only reason why I don't have it at number one is due to the fact I felt um, the writing of the script could have been handled a little bit better. Um, I could tell that there were some plot holes in the script. Um, so yeah, like for example, I know some, I have seen this also from other fans and critics as well, where they would discuss like now that at the very end due to the uh, Doctor Strange's you know, powers, he grants Peter's wish that no one remembers that Peter Parker is Spider-Man, that no one, like, no one remembers him, basically. He is just, he's just there. No one remembers him. Happy doesn't remember him, MJ doesn't remember him, Ned doesn't remember him, and it seems to me like even the school system doesn't remember him. Because at the very end, you see Peter Parker, he has, like, a GED book. So, you know, but my only question is, if people were to see, you know, pictures of Peter Parker, you know, next to MJ, next to Ned, next to Aunt May, will they ask, like, will they know that that's Peter Parker, or are they going to say, who's that kid? Like, I felt like it wasn't specified enough. Um, also, you know, some people have also asked, oh, well, does that mean the Guardians of the Galaxy, and, uh, you know, like, people in other parts of the universe, like Captain Marvel, will they remember that Peter Parker is Spider-Man? due to the fact that they were not present on Earth when that uh, spell was taking place. So, uh, like, you know, is it the whole universe will remember? I don't know. It felt like it wasn't very clear enough, but I'm pretty sure they're going to explain it in the later movies and other Avengers movies are probably going to explain it. Um, and also, I felt like some of the, the, uh, the decisions that some of the characters made were kind of dumb. Like, for example... Aunt May persuading her nephew Peter to um, keep the villains in our universe to help them out, which on the surface seems like something very noble and very good to do, don't get me wrong. I like that she saw that these villains had a heart. However, Doctor Strange did explain to Peter, and Peter did try to explain to Aunt May that keeping them in the universe, in their universe for so long, could break the fabric of reality and time. So, you know, you know, how does, I have seen one YouTuber comment this, this was from the John Campia show, if you guys are subscribed to his channel, please check out his review, it's really cool. He even says it himself, he's like, in the words of Mr. Spock, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. So, you know, eh, you know, whose needs are you going to put ahead first and you know you should probably be more concerned about the needs of the people in your universe versus that of outside of your universe and who actually have a criminal villainous record so you know it i don't know i just like i understand their motivation was it had good intentions but mm, you know how would that have affected everybody else uh, especially if you're considering time and reality and then it, it was kind of sad to see because you know due to their decision it have resulted into the death of Aunt May you know it's like one of those things where you think about none of this would have happened if you guys had just sent them home if you had sent them home you know Aunt May would probably still be alive Peter Parker wouldn't have to ask for everyone to forget about him so you know it's like uh eh, you know it, it could have been prevented kind of thing but then you wouldn't have gotten this awesome movie you wouldn't have gotten the other Spider-Man popping up into the universe so it's like, eh, you know, like, 
It's just some of the characters made some dumb decisions, but still, you got an awesome, spectacular movie. The action was awesome, and again, it's so surreal and so awesome to see all the Spider-Men together. Loved it. Now, moving on to number one. Number one on my list at the top of 2021 for me was Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. Was this movie on a grand scale as Spider-Man No Way Home? No, but the reason why I have it at number one was due to the script. I thought the writing for Shang-Chi was a lot stronger. Um, I didn't see like any plot holes or anything. Again, no film is perfect. Every, um, you know, film has its flaws, of course. However, I just thought the writing for Shang-Chi was a little bit stronger, um, which is why I have it at number one. I think the father and son dynamic between Shang-Chi and his father Wen Wu, aka the Mandarin, was, you know, it, it, it was something very, it was very like Darth Vader, Luke Skywalker type from Star Wars, you know. The father is evil, he wants his son to join him, but the son wants to be good. And, you know, the son tries to help his father, like, in a sense, redeem himself to, to show him that what he's doing isn't correct. So th there's this whole message also about family, you know, and of course, Shang-Chi trying to reconnect with his sister, um, Su Shaoling, also Shang-Chi, um, learning or embracing his fighting techniques from that of his mother, and also Win Wu trying to reconnect with his wife you know that was the love of his life and when you see that the, his wife was murdered you know he is just emotionally like just torn apart he wants revenge so for me Tony Leung's performance as Wen Wu for me is Oscar worthy kind of like Michael I, like for example I thought Michael B. Jordan's Killmonger was an amazing performance you felt sympathy for the villain and that's something that's really hard to do you know the villain is doing bad things here left and right but you also kind of see why they're doing it and it's because they lost someone so dear to them so, and they think that that's the, the only way that they could cope is basically just getting revenge and you know they think that brings them happiness i guess you could say so it, it's a very complex character but it's such a fascinating character and not only that, the martial arts in this movie was amazing. That bus scene, when Shang-Chi had to fight Razor Fist and all the other um, goons and henchmen sent by the Ten Rings, you know, that bus scene was amazing. Amazing action sequence I have ever seen. I also love the, the dance fighting love battle between Wen Wu and um, his future wife. Um, I think her name is... Oh my gosh, I'm trying to remember... Uh, Jing Li, I think that's her name. I can't remember right now on the top of my head. But I really, I really enjoyed the choreography of that. You could see the two falling in love when they're in Tao Lo. Um, the dance fight scene, like it, it was basically, they, you could tell they were falling in love. I would have fallen in love too. And then also, I love the the uh, final battle. Um, Final battles, I know some fans tend to complain that most final battles in Marvel, of course, look typical. It's CGI and everything. Like, okay, yeah. However, I did enjoy with the dragon and whatnot. And again, the fight as to how the Ten Rings were used between Shang-Chi and Wen Wu. I thought it was, again, the martial arts were choreographed very well. And the writing, the script, of, as to exploring the whole family dynamic and that that was basically the message of this movie was was basically family right i thought it was done very well the story and the action were done very well in this movie so yeah guys that's it that was my list for marvel studios you know the mcu phase 4 2021 let me know down in the comments below how you guys would rank the projects that we have gotten this year from marvel so yeah let me know down in the comments below do you guys agree with my list disagree with my list just let me know down in the comments below, like and subscribe, and as always, take care guys. Bye!